It's really a pleasure for me to be here and talk to you about research in honeybees. Uh, it's a subject I'm certainly very passionate about. And it's been a really fun opportunity to be able to be at UW-Stout where we have access to uh, helpful beekeepers in the area here and really interested and bright and motivated students. So uh, thanks to the students for being here. Uh, as well. It's been a, it's, it's really been because of the students that we've done this research. There's no question about that. Okay, so when most people think about honeybees, they think about summertime and the important role that honeybees serve for all of us. And it's really a pleasure to be a beekeeper in western Wisconsin during the summertime because it's amazing how well the bees do. It's kind of like gardening it seems like. It's amazing how well it works when it works well. But it's also really amazing how it doesn't work well when things go wrong. And so the other part of the year, the bees in winter, is really a different story. So it's really about bees during the winter time that I'm going to talk to you tonight about. Because honeybees are really interesting and unusual among insects in that it's the only insect I can think of, Dr. Bomar, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the only insect I can think of that keeps itself warm all winter in this climate. Is there any such insect? So. So this is, a, this is an interesting property. It's also a huge problem for bees when their systems aren't working correctly. So wintertime in western Wisconsin is really a challenge for honeybees. And most of us, if we lose our hives, we'll lose them during the winter. So there's a lot of interest in what we can do to keep our bees well through the winter. But it's been a really tough problem. And in, in our county group, in the Dunn County Beekeepers group, we've tallied this a few times and found out the losses are often between 70 and 80 percent countywide. So we're certainly m losing more than we're keeping through the winter. So this is a huge problem. This picture here shows a hive of healthy bees. This was one of the unusual examples that I had where the bees made it through the winter, uh, through this winter very well. They went into the winter, or into the winter strong. They had a good summer, a good fall. They went into the winter uh, healthy and they made it all the way through the winter. So it's proof that it sure can work right and it works well when it does, um, but it usually doesn't. And so what you see in this picture is uh, these are all live bees. There was a sheet of blue rigid foam insulation over these and if, if I take that off and look there then I could see all these healthy bees and just below them this is the this is the uh, access to the inner hive there's a lot of healthy bees in there um, and so that's the way it should look but I don't have to tell too many beekeepers what it's like when they don't make it through the winter and um, the situation that I often find in a failed hive in the wintertime is a small cluster of frozen bees and this picture here on top shows you can actually see about what the diameter of that of that cluster is it's about like that and then the picture below it just shows what it looks like when you remove the dead bees on the surface and you see all these bees pointed head first into the cells and and those that have seen this have seen it over and over and it's a sad thing to see and when I first began seeing that in Wisconsin I asked what does that mean and the answer was always the same thing what does that mean I'm asking you what does that mean it's starvation and so I think that's probably true although I've never really seen where that's been proven but it's always assumed to be starvation um, but the interesting thing is, usually you can find honey in good stored amounts very close to these frozen clusters. So it's not that the beekeeper didn't leave enough honey, it's just that the bees can't get to it 
when the cluster shrinks down to some critical point. And then you get a cold snap, the bees are pinned down, they can't move laterally to get to their stores, and they freeze to death, with sometimes plenty of honey remaining in the hive. So there's one thing I'm pretty sure about. Honeybees don't die of the cold. They could, and they would if they're individuals, but as long as they have the critical mass, they don't die of the cold. Um, I may come back to this later, but I'm going to throw it out now. I also don't think we lose too many hives from Nosema. I don't think so. I don't see the evidence of it. Maybe I just haven't seen the evidence of it. Uh, but this situation is pretty common, and what causes it? And the answer is probably a number of things. But what seems to be the case is when you go into the, uh, into the early fall with a really strong hive, and you end up like this, it's pretty clear that the colony has been bleeding bees for a while. And the colony does just bleed bees. Bees are just dying steadily too fast. So, I'm going to break this talk into three parts, and I'm going to try to move through my slides pretty fast so we have time for questions at the end. So, part one, I'm going to talk about some hemocyte profiling. I'll define that in a second. Part two will be about this new bacterial infection that we found. Part three will be some of the really kind of new things that we're doing in the research lab. Hemocyte profiling is a method that, as far as I know, we developed here at Stout in this building where we characterize the white blood cells of honeybees. And we find out that they have kind of profiles and you compare one bee to another, these profiles are kind of different. We called it hemocyte profiling. I think it was in the late summer of 2013 when Mike Kruger and I, this is a picture of Mike, then a UW Stout undergraduate, we started collecting the blood from bees. It's called hemolymph, um, but we'll call it blood for now. And I don't remember if Mike taught me or I taught him. I think we kind of taught each other, but we learned how to do this. And so as we collected the blood from the honeybees, we were really interested in what was in it and what could we find and what could we study. And so Mike and I learned how to do this. We taught other students. And over the following few years, we taught probably several hundred students at UW-Stout to collect the blood from honeybees. And this picture shows exactly that, uh, that process going on. It kills the bee to do this. Uh, you have to chill the bee so you can handle it. So they're live bees, we collect live bees, we put them in a little plastic bottle, we put them in a cooler with ice, wet ice, and they cool down and they go right to sleep because bees can't tolerate being cold. They pass right out, but they don't die. And if they warm up, they'll start moving around again. Um, and so this is the collection of hemolymph, and we were really interested what we could do. First, we wanted to see what was in it, so we put it on microscope slides. Uh, and we could see, when we're looking at just the liquid, what appeared to be blood cells. Well, we didn't know what they were. They turned out to be blood cells. Blood cells in honeybees are called hemocytes. And they have actually surprising number of functions of white blood cells of humans, some, some quite similar. But when we tried to stain these cells to get a better look at them with the same blood stain that you would stain human blood, it's called a right stain, we could never see them. And we were real frustrated by that. And we learned eventually that if you first coat the slide with a dilute solution of gelatin, you can get the cells to stick just fine. And so when we did that and stained them, then with the right stain, we could sure enough see these cells. And we realized right away when we started looking at them, we could see all kinds of different cells. Well, there were about four different kinds of cells. And we had these pictures. We were taking these pictures and we were thinking, wow, what is known about this? Nowhere on the internet could you find a picture of a honeybee white blood cell. Nowhere. Um, because there was a trick to getting them to stick to the slide. It wasn't hard once we knew what it was. 
But once we started looking, we realized that there are these different types. And in this picture, you can see that as well. And at about that same time, a student, Will Moringa, here he is, Klaus. Will, also then an undergraduate student, uh, was interested in what would happen if we ran this bee's blood through the flow cytometer. This is a machine specially designed to characterize cells. And so here's Will running samples through the flow cytometer. And what we found was, after we uh, worked with different colored dyes, fluorescent dyes, how we could separate the populations of these hemocytes out into four different subsets. And so you can see these four quadrants that are populated by these different cells. We figured out which cells were in which quadrants. And we realized that we could quantify the percentages of these different cells and therefore come up with sort of a serial number or barcode of that B. And that's the hemocyte profile. And when we looked at a few different bees, we realized from one bee to the next, and they all appeared to be healthy, there were wild differences between these hemocyte profiles. So, uh, and we could look at five different parameters. We could look at three colors of fluorescence and two different scatter profiles. And shown here are um, one, two different colors of fluorescence and one, two different scatter profiles. You're looking, this is one bee here uh, looking at these cells in four different parameters, four different dimensions. And so we could get a ton of information from a single bee. And if you compare this profile and this profile and that profile, those three are all different honeybees. Those are all different single bees, showing you how different these profiles are from one bee to the next. And we realized that these bees had different possibilities for their immune functions. And we don't think that's an accident. We assume Mother Nature designed it that way, but no one yet has cracked the code to figure out what these different profiles mean. We're very interested in this. And I have hoped, since we published this paper in 2014, someone would solve this. And it surprisingly just hasn't been taken up. To me, it's so interesting. Yeah? Do you know if these bees are all the same age? All the same age. We don't know that. And so it could be a simple difference of age. And I totally agree. And even that would be really interesting. Yeah? Different drones? could be from different drones, and that would be really interesting. It seems like any, any scenario is interesting, but they're different, that's for sure. Anyway, so we published this with the point that when we compared hives that had different loads of varroa mites, we could see different profiles. So we thought that meant something, and so we published that. So that was what I might regard roughly as chapter one of our bee study. So um, it wasn't more than a few weeks later, well, it was when the weather got cold, I guess, um, we stumbled on, and I mean stumbled, onto something very unexpected, and that was uh, what I'll really say most about tonight, a possible new bacterial infection in the honeybees. So as a hive bleeds bees, through the late summer and through the fall and into the winter and through the winter, at some point it has not enough bees, not a critical mass to keep it warm. And at that point they get pinned down. They get cold, they get pinned down, they starve to death. I think that's what happens. And this is what it looks like. This is the final days of a hive that I was taking care of. This thing was, was absolutely strong through the summer and fall. I, I've seen this year after year. I'm beginning to expect it. But this cluster is still alive, but that's all there is. That is not a hive. That is not a hive. Um, even, if, even if it has a queen, uh, it's going to struggle, assuming it even makes it to spring. I don't know. I guess it's possible, but that's not how you want to start off the spring. So 
Beekeepers are a really interesting group. They have this natural scientific gene, that's all I can say. They try everything to keep their bees alive. They experiment and it's tough. It's really tough to get it to work in spite of the really thoughtful uh, ideas that the beekeepers have. And I've tried things too. One of the things I tried was surrounding my bees with insulation. I thought, God, it's got to help it to keep them warmer. So here's a couple of hives uh, right up against each other with, with insulation all the way around, insulation on top. You can see this blue rigid foam insulation. And I'd cover that with uh, some bricks and some plywood. And then in the winter, I would go out and check on the bees. I was interested to see if they were still alive. And so I figured out if I go out at night and I have a little hole right here and another little hole right here, these are ventilation holes. Because to keep warm, bees have to metabolize honey. And so they metabolize the honey, they produce carbon dioxide and water, and they generate heat. And they really do stay warm. And that that moisture then would go out of these ventilation holes. You could go out at night on a dark night with a flashlight and hold it up by those holes and you could see the column of steam coming right up out of there. And I know those bees are alive. But I went out one night and I looked and here's what I saw. I saw this hive here with no bees, dead bees around it and I saw this hive here with some dead bees around it. I thought that's weird and I brushed them off and I uh, look for the steam, sure enough steam, I go back inside. A few nights later, same thing. But this hive, more dead bees. And I thought, what's going on in there? And so those dead bees accumulating on the hot top of the hive became uh, uh, a very fortunate break for us in our research. They're sick. And they're trying to leave the hive. At least that's my thought. That may be wrong, but it's my thought. So we investigated one of these hives further, so I'm starting to open it up. I've got the blue foam insulation off of it now. And what you see is you can see the hole going down in there, and these are very active, very live bees, seem very healthy. But all around the edge, the periphery, you have all these what I thought were dead bees. And there were a lot of them and the bee, the hives, were bleeding bees upwards. They were probably bleeding downwards as well, but I could see them coming up. And when I take the inner cover off and look, what I see is a cluster. And that's a, it's an okay cluster. I'd like to see it bigger, but it's okay. A lot of live healthy bees in there. Notice no dysentery no diarrhea. As long as that cluster is alive, no diarrhea. The diarrhea happens right at the point of death. That is not nosema, at least not to me. I've looked for nosema in that deposits of diarrhea when a, when a cluster dies. So I focused on these bees. Here's a group I thought they were dead. These are definitely alive. Put them in a jar, took them into the lab, and I got Jake Hildebrand after them. Jake Hildebrand is an undergraduate student here at UW-Stout. He arguably is a person who has collected more hemolymph from honeybees than any other person. Just a guess. Maybe wrong, but it could be. So I knew if anyone could figure this out, Jake could help me. So he started collecting samples. And, and Vivienne was collecting samples and we were really going to town looking at these. Uh, the sick bees, we thought they were dead, and the well bees. The interesting thing about those bees that we thought were dead, when we put them in a bottle and took them into the lab, if we accidentally left them laying on the counter, which we always tried to be careful not to do for live bees, but we didn't think it mattered for these, they started moving around. So the bees we thought were dead were not dead. At least not all of them were dead. And those that did regain movement did so very, very sluggish movement. They're sick. They're really sick. So I thought, these bees do look sick. 
And when we put a sample of the hemolymph onto a glass slide and looked at it through the microscope, this is what we saw. At this moment, we knew we're looking at something quite unexpected and potentially important. Um, that's the raw hemolymph from the bee. And you can't get the concentration of bacteria much higher than that. You just can't. And these bees were still alive. Not well, but they were alive. OK, so we found this bacterium over and over as we looked at these sick, sluggish bees that had crawled up and out of the cluster and were presumably on their way to dying. And we all, in the winter, but we also found it in the drones in the summer. We never found, I don't think we ever found, the, the bacterium in a worker bee in a warm weather month. Why not? They die outside the hive. They leave the hive, I think. This is my speculation, but it's actually supported by very good research at the University of Minnesota, Marla Spivex lab has described many times hygienic behavior and bees do this for the sake of the colony they leave when they get sick when they get sick enough but the drones we could find them in the summer but they were leaving the hive too but we were finding them crawling around on the ground in front of the hive and we could find them all summer long and the concentration of bacteria in their hemolymph was even higher so we started getting more students and collecting more samples. And here's Tony, Tony Hennings. He's a student here, was a student at UW-Stout. He's an excellent microbiologist. He could use two inoculating loops at once. Here's one and here's the other one. It's sort of like doing math with two calculators at the same time. It's beyond me. But anyway, he cultured a lot of bee samples for us. And here's Brooke, and she was a student in my microbiology class, and she's reading a culture. And we actually worked with some of the students from UW River Falls. Here are a couple of students from UWRF who came uh, from Brad and Kim Mogan's lab, and they worked with us as well, and they were excellent at collecting the bee's blood uh, uh, as well. And see the focus? You can't coach that into a person. That's natural talent. OK, so we found the bacterium in worker bees in the winter. We found the bacterium in drones in the summer. And since we were finding the bacterium in the bees' blood, and we know that varroa mites feed on the blood, the obvious question was, could you find it in the varroa mites? And we did. And so here is a culture plate from a single varroa mite. And two things could be said. That's a lot of bacteria from a single mite. What's that? It's a pure culture. It's a pure culture. It's a pure culture, and it's a large concentration. And uh, Amber, you helped me do this. Amber piloted a lot of the work for figuring out how to culture mites. So we found it in the bees. We found it in the mites. The mites feed on the blood of the bee. Is this connecting the dots? Um, a question you should all have is, OK, what's the proof that the bacterium makes bees sick? Because I'm getting that from the scientific community, and I should. But I'm trying to build the story for you, so see if it is making sense. We also worked with different kinds of microbiological augers so that when we found the bacterium, we could recognize it based on how it grew on a petri plate. And one of the things that this bacterium does is it destroys DNA. It utilizes DNA for food. Most bacteria that we were finding don't do that. So we have this special medium called DNA auger that has this blue dye called methylene methyl green, and when the bacterium liberates this enzyme to break down the DNA, 
the medium turns clear. So it goes from blue to clear. So you can tell which three bees were infected up here. And the other three bees not only didn't have uh, clearing of the blue color, but didn't grow any bacteria. Uh, in, the, in, these, in the sections B, D, and E, that's solid bacteria. And we also found out that the bacterium has another appearance on a different kind of medium where it has these little red colony centers, and that was helpful because we really wanted to be able to recognize it when we saw it. So we sent the sample to Mad UW-Madison, the biotechnology lab, and they sequenced a part of the genome corresponding to the 16S subunit of the ribosomal RNA. And we know that if we compare any different living organism to this gene, which we all living organisms have, except for viruses, then we can begin to categorize this thing genetically, because so far all we had was some, some appearances of how it behaved. And when we did the analysis on this and compared it to the database, it came back serratia. And I was really surprised by that, because I worked with serratia for many years. Uh, I was a medical technologist in the lab in the hospital for a, for a number of years, and I grew a lot of serratia marcescens. This didn't look anything like any serratia that I had ever seen. So I thought, mm, probably isn't right, must not be right, but it was right. So that didn't tell us a lot to look at the 16S sequence. So we sequenced, we had UW-Madison <laughs> sequence the entire genome, which is a pretty amazing task and something that we haven't been able to do until fairly recent time. 5.11 million base pairs of DNA. Um, and when we compared that whole genome sequence against all the serratia that have ever been sequenced, and there's quite a few, they're all shown here actually, uh, each little end of a little branch is a different organism, you can see that based on similarities and differences of whole genomes, that this thing actually fit very, there it is right there, it fit very well into a clade of bacteria known as the serratia marcescens clade. It's a serratia marcescens. It's very clear. It's just, it just behaves differently. And so here are all of the serratia marcescens in this clade. And here's our organism right here. And the organism that our bacterium, which we named serratia marcescens strain sicaria, or SS1 for short, it's most related to, uh, uh, to this strain called SCBI. I forget what that stands for. But SCBI was a serratia that they isolated from, uh, Dr. Bomar, see if I got this right, Galleria melanella, the wax moth. It's a bacterial pathogen of the wax moth, which is a pest of honeybee hives. We have no idea if that's anything other than coincidence, but um, one's tempted to speculate maybe that's where this came from. We don't know. The numbers or concentrations of bacteria that we found in these bees was, was unexpectedly high. In the, the symptomatic infected workers, those are those ones we found in the winter that warmed up and could only crawl around barely, the concentration of bacteria in their blood was over a billion per milliliter. And if in the summertime we cultured hundreds and hundreds of normal bees and found a few that had the bacterium, a very few, I think it was about 3%, but the concentration on average of their, theirs was about 10,000 fold lower. The concentration in the symptomatic infected drones was the highest of all, 10 billion bacteria per milliliter. And in the mites that we cultured, the concentration was actually very comparable to the concentration of the bacteria in the, bee, the worker bees that were very sick. We don't think that's a coincidence. We think, we think, it's speculating, that the varroa mites take their blood meal from 
the worker bee, and when we culture them, and they're, not all the varomites are positive. On the average, about half, sometimes as high as 70 percent, usually above 15 percent. But when we culture those mites, that's actually what we're finding is the hemolymph, or the blood, in the mite. Those are very high concentrations. By comparison, a human dies from a blood infection when the concentration of bacteria is about 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 per milliliter. That will kill a human. Um, these bees and the drones were sometimes showing a million-fold higher concentration of bacteria, and they're still alive. That says something about an insect, the hardiness of an insect. Okay, so went back to the flow cytometer, and uh, because remember we saw the bacteria in the blood of the bee, and we didn't see hemocytes. So we went back to the flow cytometer, and we asked the question: Can we see evidence of loss of these white blood cells? And the answer is yes. We should. We sure could see that. And so if you look at a normal bee, there's the four populations, the four quadrants. That's a normal bee, although it varies a lot. But in an infected bee, these really badly infected bees, about all you found were these events in the quadrant number three. Now, quadrant number three are not hemocytes. They're not blood cells. They're particles of cells. And so what it seemed to suggest is you go from a normal bee like this with hemocytes to shattered hemocytes and basically nothing, to, nothing other than debris. But we're still registering events in all four quadrants. But you can see by comparing the difference between this normal bee and this infected bee, the evidence is actually a lot stronger than the numbers. Because we're still seeing numbers there. But you can see with your eye the difference. Question? When you show the pictures in the four different quadrants, uh -huh. the lower left-hand one was a cluster of three grape-like cells that were nucleated. They're actually not nucleated. The, like they and nucleated. and uh, they did, they yes. Center. What's that? They had a dark center. Yes, and sometimes with the right stain, if you weren't careful, you would leave a little bit of stain behind, and it would give the impression they didn't, that they had nuclei, very, very small nuclei. So those were cellular fragments? Well, they're called microparticles. Uh, we called them microparticles. It actually compared with uh, some evidence in the literature. Membrane blebbing. Platelets are a lot like this as well. We have a lot of pic we took a lot of pictures of those. They didn't always, they usually didn't form those clusters. But that's a good observation. So, when I look at that scattered ground in the top right, this one? which is a normal bee, yeah. you're saying that even the normal hemolymph has a fair number of, of those clubs or whatever. Yes. Particles. Yes, this is normal. In terms of cellular material, is it the same kind of cellular material of the other three types of Good cells? question. We don't know the origin of the microparticle. Okay. Oh, back one, one minute. We also, in the infected bees, found these large granular particles that we did. At first we thought, ah, there, there's an important clue here. Here's the bug. Um, and, 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 um, but actually what these turned out to be was pollen grains. So in these really badly infected bees with these really high concentrations of, bac of bacteria, we found pollen in their blood. What does that suggest? <laughs> Thanks, Willie. I was counting on you. <laughs> Injury, yeah. It suggested to us, and we reported this, and they let us keep this in the manuscript, we didn't think they would, that it suggested that the infection was eroding the membranes of the digestive tract and liberating the digestive contents into the, into the blood. We didn't prove it, but that's what it suggested. And so here's a picture of hemolymph from a badly infected bee. Here's a pollen grain. And there's a lot of debris, a lot of bacteria. And it really suggests that in those badly infected bees, their 
membranes that contain their digestive tracts are failing. It didn't always happen, but it happened often enough. And this inset of this graph here shows the pollen grains comparing normal bees to asymptomatic infected workers, then to symptomatic infected workers. As you go up in concentrations of bacteria, you get a significant difference in those heavily infected bees of pollen grains. Now we worried at first that this was an artifact, because if when you collect the sample and you poke into the bee to lacerate the heart, which is what you have to do, if you go too deep, you lacerate the digestive tract as well. And so we knew that this was a possible problem. But anyway, we, uh, it was Jake Hildebrand, actually, who came to me and said, I don't think we're breaking those digestive tracts. I think, and if you watch when you collect the sample on those really badly infected bees, the minute you puncture through that outer cuticle, that hemolymph would flow out, almost as though it was under pressure. We, were, we watched that carefully, and we, made, we published that as an observation. Okay, so um, what we reported, our results, we looked at over 3,000 bees, uh, and we looked at over 1,000 mites. We did uh, various tests. We did hemocyte profiling. We did culture analysis on these. 91 different hives from people in this part of the country. Uh, a lot of them from Dunn County, but I also visited uh, beekeep, beekeep, uh, the beekeeping group to, to the east, uh, to the west, uh, Pearson St. Croix, uh, up north by Balsam Lake, went into uh, eastern Minnesota, and everyone was wonderfully helpful bringing us bees and mites. Um, so we looked at quite a few hives. 33 of the 91 hives had mites, one or more mite, usually a lot, that tested culture positive. 66 of the hives produced bees where we had one or more bee that had an obvious positive culture. And we also had, uh, we also worked with beekeepers to bring in samples from winter killed hives. And we looked at 33 of those winter killed hives, and of those, 73% uh, of those winter killed hives had one or more bee that was culture positive for this bacterium. And it was always the same bacterium from the bees and the mites. Yep? The pollen was contaminated? Uh, oh, no, that's a good question. We did not. Yeah, that's not in my skill set very well to examine it for those, but that's a really important question. Yep? Is it possible that pollen could be getting into the chemo cell also through the, a puncture from the mite in the soft abdominal tissue? You know, that's a, that's a good question, too. Um, maybe. Maybe. So you're thinking from the outside of the bee rather than from the digestive tract. Right. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, can't, can't rule it out. OK, and we, just, we found this new bacterium that we call SS1. So that, that we're all very sure about. Then we began to speculate. And the question was, can we correlate the presence of the bacterium with illness in bees? What do you think? Is there enough evidence? Did we do the right thing or wrong thing to publish this? Do you see evidence of pathology? Are those bees sick? We thought so. Uh, what's the geographic location of SS1? Well, we found it in every county we looked for it, in which we looked, in Wisconsin. We found it in every county in which we looked in Minnesota. Yep? Did you try testing any of the bees when they come in on the truck? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Last spring, we tested a package of bees that came in 
from outside. Now, I can't say where. Because I think... Which truck? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd ask that, Willie. Yeah. <laughs> this is... Uh, it's, it's a really important question, and the answer is yes. We found the bacterium in multiple mites. Amber did this. Amber, where was the trunk? Amber, raise your hand. Don't tell him, Amber. <laughs> we found the bacterium in multiple mites from um, package bees coming in from out of state. Okay, so um, we think it's not just in this area. We're pretty sure about that. Um, it seems, and we didn't prove this, that the bees actually leave the hive at some point when they become symptomatic. And, and it, seems that, it seems that they can tolerate a concentration up to some point and then they leave. And that's why we could never find bees infected in the summer, worker bees, but we found drones. So the drones also seem to want to leave the hive when they feel sick, but they don't do it as effectively as the workers do, it seems, because we could find them pretty easily. Yep? Did you test any caps brood? We tested capped drone brood that had varroa mites in it, and we found the bacterium. As far as I know, we never saw evidence that the bacterium infects worker brood. It is not a brood disease, as far as I know, and therefore, if that's true, it would be the only bacterial disease transmitted by a varroa mite to adults. Yep. Okay. This is really important. Um, with the drone group, you can tell if it's infested with mites. Yep. Oh, yeah. And we only cultured the ones that we knew had mites. I agree. See, there's more work to do. Because some, some of these diseases are passed through from the queen. Mm -hmm. And they may be transmitted I agree, and we worried about that, and we still think about it, but we never saw evidence of unhatched brood that suggested this. We never saw well, workers <laughs> similar to what you would see with foul brood, I expect. Um, so we didn't see an, un, you know, an uneven hatch pattern, which really would suggest a brood disease. It's a good question. We can't rule it out. The reason it's so, I think it's so important, Jim, yeah. is that if you can prove that this is a disease of adults, yeah. then, and that it's transmitted by the mite, mm -hmm. then you give the beekeeper hope for having a disease-free hive. If it's not, you know, if, if the, say the worker brood has this bug in it, mm -hmm. okay, that means they're getting it from the queen, or mm -hmm. at least when they're still, you know. As long as they're not infected by varroa mites. Right, yeah, and mostly it's drones that are infected by varroa, we know that, but, but what I'm saying is that if you can show that they're disease free while they're still brood, Okay, then you the workers. The, bee, the workers. Mm -hmm. You give the beekeeper hope okay. of having a disease-free hive. You can get rid of, of um, drone foam, for example. Yep. You know, so you can eliminate some of the disease that way. Yeah, I agree. I agree that it's an important point. It's an important point that should be pinned yeah. down. Um, I will say again, I see no evidence of worker or drone brood that's infected by this organism without the mite. Yeah. Our hives had two different queens from two different years. They've been purchased through the club. So the, um, ideally, they are not related. Yep. 
But no what? No disease. We have had clean hives. And I have tested your hives repeatedly and never found the serratia. Right. I agree. So is it genetic? Or is I don't it know. Environment? I don't know. It, it was an interesting anomaly. Yep. Out uh, of all these tests, did you ever try queens? Yes, we definitely uh, found a dead queen twice and found the serratia in her. And I had one hive that had a bad serratia infection. I re-cleaned it like five times and never could get a queen to catch. Kept dying. I think that's why, but couldn't prove it. Yep. In the drone group that we tested, did you test the weights that were in there? Yes, and we found the serratia. It's not in, it's either definitely in the mite or it is definitely not in the mite. It is absolutely clear one way or another. Anyway, I'm going to motor along and I'll be happy to answer any and all questions, but I don't want to make this take too long. Okay, so we published our paper last December. You can go online, type in plus one, comma, uh, serratia, and you'll find it. It's free. You can download it freely accessible, take a look at it. Okay, so here's my theory. It's just a theory. So much of this theory is not proven. Um, the varroa mite transmits the bacterium to a new uninfected hive. That's how it starts. Uh, there's a new PLOS One paper that came out. Did anyone see it where they have a little artificial flower with a varroa mite sitting on it? and they have the, the honey or sugar water and a honey bee comes in and that mite jumps on that bee so fast. So I think, I think this transfer of varroa mites between hives is a, is a real problem. As far as I know, we don't have a, a, a beehive in this state without varroa mites. Am I wrong or right? I don't think there is such a thing Okay, so the mite is a very successful organism. Okay, so a new mite can feed on these infected bees, and not all mites are positive, but at some point they pick it up, and they can transmit this to new bees and new hives when they go from hive to hive, and they do. I think there's, there's, there's pretty good new research about this drifting uh, situation. And the bacteria and this is a theory, but it may be true, the bacterium actually doesn't hurt the mite. Just a thought. The bees slowly, and slow is important for this infection to transmit. You can't just wipe out all the bees. You infect slowly, and that allows this transmission dynamic to take place. And at some point, then the bee leaves a hive when it gets sick enough. And, in, and when the queen stops laying, or for whatever the dynamic is, you start losing more bees than you have raising new bees, you lose the hive, especially in cold weather. But it's very possible, and I have proven this, to have the serratia in the hive all the way through a full year in western Wisconsin. It doesn't take the whole hive down every time. But I think it does part of the time, maybe a lot of the time. I don't know. We haven't proven that. Okay, last and quickly, new work that we're involved in is to develop a set of immunological probes to various proteins of the honeybee hemolymph. We're immunizing mice with honeybee hemolymph and we're generating new antibodies that recognize the different proteins of um, proteins of the honeybees. And here we have students that have been part of this process and please talk to them after the talk and ask them what's going on. And uh, two of the students here at UW-Stout in particular have piloted this project, uh, Jake Hildebrand on the left and Derek Trotsky on the right. Uh, these guys are amazing. They have uh, assisted me in uh, a lot of the work I've done and a lot of the teaching that I have done. And they have uh, done most of the work in generating new monoclonal antibodies. Here's, here's a western blot uh, of, of a 60 kilodalton protein. This turned out to be honeybee catalase. 
So we have a new immunological probe to honeybee catalase, an important antioxidant protein in the blood of the bee. And we're real interested in where that story might go because we don't know yet. A lot of other antibodies that uh, we have developed and are characterizing. And our new immunology class now is in the process of characterizing how many? Started with 70? 20? 20-ish. Yeah, there you go, 23. So we, we'll, uh, we'll have some new, uh, new antibodies for research. Okay, quickly, my views. Hives don't die of the cold, they don't die of nosema, at least not normally. Um, the varroa mites are killing our bees, but I'm very concerned about a world where we treat everything with a chemical. And I'm concerned about our reliance on the chemicals and what that's doing to the bees. So when it sounds like we can fix this with more medicine, I'm not sure that's the right direction we should be going. Other infectious agents, uh, we're uh, always looking, but uh, this bacterium, I think, is a problem. When I culture a sample that someone brings me, um, if I find the serratia, I can tell them with confidence it's there. If I don't grow it, all I can say is, I didn't find it. And sometimes I get samples that are pretty dried out and in pretty tough shape, and when I get a negative culture on those, I don't really know what it means. Therefore, I think I'm underestimating the actual prevalence of this organism. So, good samples, fresh samples, are really important in this analysis. So the bacteria doesn't survive well in the dead bee? You know, that's a good question. It lasts a year in a bee in a freezer. That I know. It's actually pretty hardy. But in a mite, it has a half-life of about 10 days. And when I get these bags of bees that look like coffee grounds, I'm not sure that I can do much with that, but I try. Um, but some of the beekeepers in this room have brought me at the county meetings bags of bees. And this happened to me one time. I, had, I was given a bit, little Ziploc bag of bees, and I had it sitting there in front of me during the meeting. And I looked, and some of them, the bees started crawling around. <laughs> and I knew, I knew those bees were infected, and they were, because that's exactly what I had found. So good, fresh samples are important, as always. Okay, acknowledgments. Uh, tremendous number of people. Uh, their names are practically too numerous to mention have participated in this research and it's been a lot of fun. And some of them are here tonight. Actually, many of them are here tonight. If you brought me samples, you helped. And I appreciate all of you doing that. We're here for the students. The research is for the students, and it's been really fun to share that with them and have them be part of it. And they've contributed immensely. I especially acknowledge the Dunn County Beekeepers, my home group, uh, and the chance that Klaus gave me to give this presentation. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, also, other beekeepers in the area, and sometimes that area is pretty big. Uh, I just got mites from Boulder, Colorado. And I have a new sample coming in from New York. And so uh, we're, we're interested in filling in the map, at least learning what we can. Funding from the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign. And with that, I'll say thank you.